Welcome to Widener University Law School, Widener University Commonwealth Law School, excuse me. It's a pleasure to see all of you here for our 13th annual Gedded Lecture. Before we begin, I'd ask, like to ask John Gedded and his lovely wife Carol to stand just for a second to be recognized. Jill is going to, Jill family is going to recognize him again in a few moments, but this is the 30th year from when Dean Gedded opened up the law school, and it's a very important anniversary for us, but I, I know it took him a couple of years before that to get everything in place, but, uh, but we owe a great deal to uh, John Gedded as our founding dean here at the law school. I'd now like to turn the time over to Professor Jill family, who's the director of our Law and Government Institute here. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Dean Johnson, uh, my fellow faculty colleagues, all of the alumni that are here, um, the Wetter uh, Commonwealth students who are here as well, as well, administrative law. I see a lot of friendly faces. We actually have administrative law in this room because there are 100 students in administrative law this semester. And as we're about to hear, um, there's good reason for that because administrative law is really in the news, cutting edge, and at the forefront of much, what, much of what is going on uh, in the political sphere. So welcome to the 13th annual Gedded Lecture. Um, this lecture honors John Gedded, who, as Dean Johnson said, is one of the founders of our law school and is also the founder of the Law and Government Institute. These lectures celebrate government law as well as John Gedded's enthusiasm and support for our law school and for legal scholarship. The Law and Government Institute is all about public service. The institute is dedicated to the study of government law, including the role of lawyers in making and implementing law. At Widener Law Commonwealth, students may er earn a certificate in government law in addition to their JD. Government law is fused into our curriculum at Widener Law Commonwealth. The Institute's mission is founded on the idea that government works and that government is a positive force in our society. At Widener Law Commonwealth, we train lawyers to be a part of that positive force. So again, I wanna thank you all for coming, as well as Sandy Grafe, who you probably saw on your way in, who is so instrumental in helping us put these events together. Brian Fernbaugh as well, as well as we have our Patrick Murphy fellows here, uh, Kim Creech and Lindsay Heisinger. I saw her earlier, she's up there. And we're so glad um, that John and his wife Carol are here for us with this afternoon. And every year um, we give John uh, his binder back. And his binder is a binder that holds flyers from each of the now 13 Getted Lectures and we have uh, the Getted Lecturer sign their flyers. So he has signed flyers from all 13. So Professor Metzger was kind enough to sign hers. So I'll give that to John as well as a little present. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker. Jillian Metzger is the Stanley H. Fooled Professor of Law at Columbia Law School where she is also a faculty co-director of Columbia Center for Constitutional Governance. She writes and teaches in the areas of administrative law, constitutional law, and federal courts. She is one of the most prominent administrative law scholars in the country. She has specialized her research on separation of powers and federalism. She is a co-editor of Gellhorn and Bice's Administrative Law Casebook, her recent law review publications have appeared in the Harvard, Michigan, and Yale Law Reviews. Professor Metzger currently is a member of the Governing Council of the American Bar Association's Section on Administrative Law and is a senior fellow of the Administrative Conference of the United States. She served as a law clerk to Justice Ginsburg on the US Supreme Court and Judge Wald on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jillian Metzger. Thank you. 
Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk with you today um, and very honored to be asked to uh, give the Get It lecture today. Um, I looked at who had given it in those past 13 years, and this is putting me in some pretty impressive uh, uh, company. Um, you've had a number of really great scholars on administrative law. So I'm hoping this is going to live up to the prior billing, but we'll see. Um, I'm also uh, particularly glad to be speaking through the auspices of uh, Widener Law and Government Institute, which was founded um, by John Geddes in 1999. I, um, these days, often say to my administrative law colleagues that whatever we think of the Trump administration's policies, we have to acknowledge a debt of gratitude because they have made administrative law the course to take and made us much more relevant and cool than we ever were before. Um, I, I do feel compelled to say that the only other course that kind of rivals administrative law these days is immigration law. Um, and as many of you know, Professor Family teaches both of those. So she is clearly the, the coolest cat um, in this crowd. Um, uh, but at, at any rate, I'm impressed that um, way before the Trump administration or the Obama administration made administrative law and government law um, so au courant um, that you founded the Law and Government Institute here. Um, the Trump administration provides the backdrop for the subject of my talk today, the administrative state under siege. Early on, the Trump White House proclaimed that the deconstruction of the administrative state was one of its main objections. Um, and it has followed through on that promise on many fronts. Some examples include a number of efforts at regulatory rollback, including President Trump's two-for-one executive order, which requires agencies to repeal two regulations for every new regulation promulgated, um, also prohibits imposition of new regulatory costs. Um, there's also uh, were initially significant regulatory rollbacks secured by virtue of the Congressional Review Act, which was called into service pretty much for the first time ever successfully to repeal a number of Obama administration major rules. Um, and agencies have undertaken significant regulatory repeals since then as well. Uh, the Trump administration has also proposed slashing a number of agency budgets, sought to reassign career officials, and in many ways remake the permanent civil service. It has indeed declared war on an amorphous uh, bureaucratic deep state particularly associated with law enforcement and national security agencies. And it has successfully added to the federal bench a number of judges who oppose um, administrative government, uh, governance and have more ideological opposition to administration. This administrative rollback has not occurred, of course, across the board. Agencies that serve the administration's policy priorities, ha such as immigration enforcement, have expanded. Um, some efforts at regulatory repeal have also floundered. Um, the prime example here was the failure, of course, to, of Congress to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, but in addition, a number of the administration's efforts at regulatory repeal in the lower courts have failed. Um, and it's also interesting that we now seem to have an active resistance um, by some agency personnel that has emerged over the last couple of years. Still, I think that the extent of anti-administrative and anti-government rhetoric in current politics is striking. And the resultant transformations in administrative governance under the Trump administration may very well prove quite significant. I'm actually, though, going to focus on an attack on administrative state coming from another quarter. And that is the, the Supreme Court under Chief Justice Roberts. The Supreme Court has turned notably anti-administrative of late, um, with justices raising questions about the constitutionality of longstanding and basic features of national administrative governance such as congressional delegations of policymaking authority, administrative adjudication, and judicial deference to agency interpretations of their governing statutes and regulations. The court has invalidated longstanding regulatory regimes on individual rights grounds as well, um, or required carve-outs, particularly on First Amendment basis. In what follows, I'm going to first describe these anti-administrative moves at the Supreme Court. I'm then uh, going to identify some key characteristics that I think identifies why this is, uh, falls into the camp of being united under the heading of anti-administrative. Um, and then I'm going to turn to putting this contemporary anti-administrativism into historical context, in particular comparing the current moves to attacks on the Ministry of State that occurred in the 1930s at the uh, beginning of the New Deal. And then finally, I'm going to argue that this Roberts Court anti-administrativism has the relationship between the administrative state and the Constitution fundamentally backwards. Rather than being unconstitutional, the national administrative state 
performs critical constitutional functions, and I'm going to argue is in fact constitutionally obligatory today. So first, the emerging anti-administrativism um, at the Roberts Court. And the cases that, that I'm going to talk about um, that present challenges to national administrative government fall into several categories. To begin with, there are a number of cases that fall under the heading of separation of powers. Um, in 2010, the Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, Kate, for example, the Supreme Court there invalidated for-cause removal protections for members of an accounting board who were appointed to their positions by the Securities and Exchange Commission. According to the five to four majority opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, the problem was that because members of the SEC itself had for-cause removal protection, the result of having the board members also having for-cause removal protection was a double for-cause protection that eviscerated the president's control and denied him the ability to ensure that the laws be faithfully executed. One effect of free enterprise um, was to spark a cottage in a industry of sorts in structural constitutional challenges. One agency that's been at the center of many of these challenges is the CFPB, the new Consumer Financial Protection Agency that was created by Dodd-Frank. It is headed by a single director who serves a five-year term and enjoys for-cause removal protection, and it is funded independently by the Federal Reserve. Um, in a panel decision that was written by now Justice Kavanaugh, uh, the D.C. Circuit struck down the, the structure, the one single director structure of the CFPB, arguing that the lack of a multi-member independent commission meant that there was too much accumulated power in single hands. Um, uh, and that decision was then overturned by the DC Circuit en banc, which upheld the constitutionality of the single director structure. But, and, and that case was not uh, taken up to the court. However, that, the CFPB structure is being challenged in a number of instances, and it's quite likely that that kind of challenge may come to the court now with Justice Kavanaugh sitting on it. Um, I, one of the things that you saw coming up in the opinions on, in free enterprise and also uh, regarding the CFPB was the idea that, that the novelty of the administrative arrangements that were involved um, uh, contributed to their uh, being unconstitutional, right? This lack of historical precedent um, uh, was an indication, in their words, of, severe, of a severe constitutional problem. Interestingly, on the other hand, in uh, the case involving recess appointments, which was Noel Canning versus NLRB, a majority of the court, um, in upholding the, uh, a broad view of the recess appointments power, although not its use in the case at hand, um, the majority had emphasized the fact that there was a long tradition of this broad reading. Um, uh, but for, for, for a significant number on the court, many of the justices who were in the majority on free enterprise, the fact that the practice had been longstanding wasn't enough to shield it from constitutional attack. And so what you see there is just an asymmetry, right? Novelty is enough to condemn a new administrative arrangement, but a lack of novelty, the fact that it's rooted in historical precedent, isn't enough to save it. Um, and that, I think, begins to give you a signal of the skepticism towards administrative government on, a, on, on the part of a sizable group on the Roberts Court. Uh, you saw that skepticism uh, last term uh, in a case uh, called Lucia versus SEC, again, addressing very longstanding relationships about how um, administrative law judges were appointed at the SEC. Uh, new uh, ALJs at the SEC were appointed by the chief ALJ. Uh, as opposed to by the commission themselves. That's fine if ALJs are just government employees. It's a violation of the appointments clause if they are inferior officers. Um, in Lucia, uh, the court held that ALJs were, in fact, inferior officers. Therefore, this method of appointing the ALJs was unconstitutional, calling into question a number of decisions by um, the SEC and other agencies that appointed their ALJs a similar way. This was an inter inter interesting case where the majority opinion was written by Justice Kagan, um, and she emphasized an earlier 1991 decision by the court as the basis for it. Um, the, the reasoning in a concurrence, however, written by Justice Thomas and joined by Justice Gorsuch would have gone much further. Um, they advocated as a test for who counts as an inferior officer that um, would be whether or not you, know, you were performing an ongoing statutory duty. That test, if it were adopted, would mean that a vast swath of the federal government, of those who work for the federal government, would now be inferior officers. Um, I'd wager that most, um, if, if not nearly all, of the people who are to, would come under that definition 
um, are likely not to have been appointed in conjunction with the inferior officer clause. And therefore, that kind of very broad reading would call into question a tremendous amount of the structures and officials and actions by the federal government. Um, given that this opinion was in the Lucia concurrence, I think we can expect that we will see more appointments clause challenges coming up in the next few years as um, uh, individuals try to get the court as a whole to adopt the Thomas and Gorsuch view. Uh, the, the Lucia case was also remarkable because of the, opinion, the stance taken by the Trump administration through the Solicitor General. The Solicitor General refused to defend the SEC, arguing that um, the ALGs had been unconstitutionally appointed, but he actually took the challenge a step further. Um, according to the Solicitor General, not only was the mechanism for appointing ALJs unconstitutional, but so was their good cause protection from removal, um, and that unless that removal protection was read broadly enough that uh, ALJs could be fired for failing to follow agency instructions and policies, then the removal protection was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court didn't reach this argument. It hadn't been in the case down below. It was added by the Solicitor General. But again, I think we will very likely see that argument coming up in challenges to the constitutionality of ALJ proceedings going forward. And it's worth noting that the removal protection that ALJs have dates back to 1946 and the Administrative Procedure Act that was adopted then that still governs in a fundamental way how the administrative state operates. Um, and a, cre a central part of the Administrative Procedure Act was providing uh, independence for administrative law judges against political control by agencies. So taking away that protection would be a very dramatic change to some very long-standing arrangements in how the federal government um, operates. Adjudication undertaken um, within the auspices of administrative agencies has been facing additional challenges at the court as well. Um, in addition to um, the ones that I just mentioned, there have been arguments that when you have administrative adjudication and it's subject only to limited review in federal court, that this violates Article Three of the Constitution. Um, the constitutionality of administrative adjudication actually was settled er early on at the beginning of the New Deal in a, a very famous case Crowell versus Benson in 1932. Um, starting in 2010, the Roberts Court started raising some questions about what's called non-Article III adjudication. Uh, the case that they started raising these questions in actually was a bankruptcy case, Stern versus Marshall, famous because it involved the former model Anna Nicole Smith. Um, uh, but those questions have also extended to adjudication by administrative agencies. And it's currently unclear how, how far the Roberts Court is willing to take its pullback on non-Article III adjudication. This came up last term as well in a decision uh, case called Oil States Energy Group versus Greens Energy Group. And the issue uh, in oil states was whether or not an administrative agency, it was the Patent and Trademark Appeals Board, could constitutionally be given power to determine whether a granted patent should be revoked because the patent had initially been wrongly granted. By a 7-2 to two vote, the court upheld the power of an administrative agency to do that. Um, interestingly, written by Justice Thomas, who has not been so favorable towards administrative agencies, and you had Justice Gorsuch and Chief Justice Roberts in dissent. But the arguments in the case are actually what matters most. Both the majority and the dissent took an originalist stance um, in terms of deciding whether or not this form of non-article free adjudication was constitutional. They just disagreed about what original practice had been. Um, if originalism is going to be the lens through which we are assessing whether or not agency adjudication is constitutional, many instances of agency adjudication will fail um, because they do not have much uh, basis back in the founding. Um, a third form of separation of powers challenges or structural challenges that we're seeing have involved delegation. Now, congressional delegation of policymaking authority to administrative agencies has been called the dynamo um, or alternatively the energizer bunny, which is my favorite, but you can take your pick, of administrative government. This reflects the fact that agencies have no inherent authority to act. Any power they use must come from Congress, or if it's an instance of exclusive uh, presidential context of, of action from the president. The court um, has sustained almost every delegation that it has seen um, uh, going back to the founding. Um, the only two exceptions are our two cases at the very outset of the New Deal, both involving extremely broad delegations of authority under the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. Nonetheless, some cases have begun recently to raise questions about the constitutionality of delegation. The first was a 2015 case called the Department of Transportation versus the Association of American Railroads. This case should be of prime importance to Amtrak writers everywhere 
which from my experience coming here today includes most of the people in this room if you're leaving Harrisburg by train. Um, at issue was the statutory regime that Congress created uh, to, to improve Amtrak's performance. And under the statute, Amtrak and the Federal Railroads Administration jointly established metrics and standards to judge Amtrak's performance. These are then also used to apply to the freight railroads who own the tracks on which um, Amtrak uh, runs. And the freight railroads had challenged these metrics and standards as an unconstitutional delegation. The lower court had actually upheld this challenge. They had said that it was unconstitutional because it represented a delegation of power to a private entity. Amtrak is statutorily styled a nonprofit corporation to set regulatory standards and um, that would also govern not just Amtrak but also its competitors. Not surprisingly, when this went up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court reversed. And I say not surprisingly because the Supreme Court had, in a prior case, held that Amtrak, for constitutional purposes, is part of government. So the whole idea that this was a private delegation was a little odd for the court to go off on. Um, but what was really surprising were the concurrences by Justices Thomas and Alito. Um, and Justice Thomas's concurrence, in particular, was striking um, because he offered a very broad attack on modern day delegations as fundamentally at odds with the original understanding of separation of powers. He argued that no delegation of policy making authority to the executive was constitutional and that generally applicable rules binding on private conduct could only be established through legislation. This was a lone concurrence, um, but it was dramatic in its strong rejection of the basic structural principle of administrative government. Uh, also, Justice Gorsuch has actually expressed sympathy with um, Thomas's attack on delegation when he was on the Tenth Circuit. Uh, the, the real proof, though, of the court's willingness to maybe reconsider delegation is that it granted certiorari this term on a case, Gundy versus United States, which argues that a provision in the Sex Offender and Notification Act, also known as SORNA, represented an unconstitutional delegation. This prep, uh, pro the provision at issue delegates to the Attorney General the power to determine whether and how SORNA applies to individuals who are convicted of sex offenses before SORNA itself was adopted. Um, and the challenge raises both Justice Thomas's broad attack um, on delegation and also argues that this provision is unconstitutional under the existing delegation framework. Gundy was argued on the second day of term in October. We still do not have a decision, which suggests that it's going to be a hotly divided one. Um, and I think, however, however the case comes out, whether the delegation is upheld or not, um, the very fact that the court granted the cert in this delegation case signals how much it is willing to question this basic feature of administrative government. So these are the admit, those were uh, separation of powers challenges. Um, uh, that's the first category. Second category involves attacks on deference doctrines that govern how courts review administrative actions. The doctrines of deference to reasonable agency interpretation of the statutes they are charged with implementing, which are known as Chevron deference, um, at least to the administrative law students in the room, I hope are familiar to you. Um, Chevron deference is a real mainstay um, of administrative law. However, it has been on the defensive for the last few years. Justice Thomas again has led the charge, attacking Chevron as violating separation of powers because it transfers judicial power to the executive. Um, or alternatively, because it represents an unconstitutional delegation of policy-making authority to the executive. Justice Gorsuch has taken a similar stance. Um, so those are the broad-scale attacks on, de on deference. We've actually seen more limited uh, attacks as well. Chief Justice Roberts has sought to narrow the field um, to which Chevron applies. So he wrote for the majority in King versus Burwell, the Affordable uh, Care Act Task Credit case, saying that Chevron should not apply to questions of deep economic and political significance. Earlier, he had written a stinging dissent in the city of Arlington versus FCC, where he rejected applying Chevron to agency determinations of their own jurisdiction. Justice Kennedy, in one of his last opinions on the court, um, had a concurrence where he said that lower courts were deferring too much to agency interpretations. Although the court has yet to overturn uh, Chevron um, or uh, adopt one of these um, more radical attacks on it. Um, to some extent, they've already succeeded. The court has not, in a majority opinion, uh, invoked Chevron and relied on it since at least um, 2016 and probably goes back to 2014. Parties in the court rarely invoke it, including the Solicitor General. And actually, in an opinion just uh, issued last month, Justice Gorsuch approvingly remarked on this and said that basically Chevron was now no longer um, governing. Uh, so that's Chevron. 
under attack, perhaps gone, um, unlikely, fully gone, but you can see where things stand. Another doctrine of deference where we see attacks happening goes under two names. It's called either seminal rock deference or our deference, and it involves deference to uh, agencies' interpretations of their own regulations. Um, the last time that our deference was sort of put forward by the court is a 1997 opinion unanimously written by Justice Scalia stating for it that, of course, we grant very strong deference to agency interpretations of the regulation. He changed his mind um, a few years before his death and actually uh, started attacking our deference as um, uh, at odds with separation of powers. It delegated power to the agencies to interpret their own roles, rules, too much power in one set of hands, and also as a, vi a violation of notice and comment um, rulemaking requirements. You've had several other justices on the court echo those attacks. And again, the Supreme Court has granted cert and has on its docket, um, it was just argued last week, a case calling for our deference to be overturned. The case is Kaiser versus O'Rourke. Um, and again, the Trump administration came in and um, although it, it was nominally defending some deference to agencies, actually agreed with much of the attack on our deference. Um, a third category, so we've got separation of powers, we've got the deference doctrine, a third category of attacks on administrative uh, government center on individual rights claims, particularly the First Amendment, right, requiring that either invalidating regulatory regimes or requiring carve-outs, Citizens United versus FCC involving corporation uh, direct election contributions is one example. There were two cases last term, National Institute of Family and Life Advocates versus Becerra and Janus versus AFSCME. Becerra involved a California law that required pregnancy-related clinics to note the availability of a variety of publicly funded family planning services, including contraception and abortion, and to post notices if they weren't a licensed clinic. The court held that the law was a content-based regulation of speech that violated the First Amendment. In Janus, the court um, similarly upheld the First Amendment challenge to a state regulatory scheme. This was the agency fee scheme. Um, that basically said if you don't want to be a member of a union, you don't have to be a member of the union, but you can be required to pay, uh, this is for state employees, you can be required to pay an agency fee that would cover the union's uh, collective bargaining um, services and representation services. Uh, such agency fee requirements had been longstanding. They had been upheld as constitutional by the court in 1977, but Janus um, now ruled them unconstitutional and shows, I think, the extent of the court's willingness to overturn longstanding regulatory arrangements on free speech grounds. You also see the court entertaining free exercise claim uh, to regulatory regimes. Last term, there was a case on that too, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Um, there, it was a, ch a free exercise challenge to a public accommodation, state public accommodation statute. The court managed to avoid a full-on challenge by essentially saying that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had engaged in intentional discrimination, but that's definitely an area where we're going to see challenges coming to the court um, in the future, and most likely um, the Roberts Court seems to be sympathetic to them. So these are three uh, categories of cases that I think represent a significant attack on the national uh, administrative state at the Supreme Court. Um, there are, to be sure, instances where the Roberts Court has rejected challenges to administrative power. Um, they upheld the Affordable Care Act uh, in NFIB versus Sibelius, although, of course, they also rejected the Commerce Power Basis and rejected the Medicaid expansion, so that's not really a full-on uh, endorsement. Um, they have not been so sympathetic to efforts to assert individual economic rights to regulatory schemes. Um, those have not yet um, uh, reached much uh, appeal. Um, still, the, the point is that the, it's not that the court is striking down all regulatory action across the board. Um, that said, the trend of these three categories is striking, um, and there are some commonality to these challenges that, to my mind, justify their linking as part of a distinct and emerging trend on the court of what I call anti-administrativism. These three traits, the first one, is a rhetorical and almost visceral resistance to administrative government portrayed as running amok. Bureaucratic bashing in the political sphere is nothing new, but it is unusual to find it in Supreme Court opinions. Some of the language is actually quite strident, so let me give you a flavor. Um, uh, some choice quotations from Chief Justice Roberts. In Free Enterprise Fund, he described federal agencies as representing a vast and varied federal bureaucracy that now wields vast power and touches almost every aspect of daily life. Um, he was even more evocative in City of Arlington, stating that the danger posed by the growing power of the administrative state cannot be dismissed. 
the citizen confronting thousands of pages of regulations promulgated by an agency directed by Congress to regulate, say, in the public interest, can perhaps be excused for thinking that it is the agency really doing the legislating. And with hundreds of federal agencies poking into every nook and cranny of daily life, that citizen might also understandably question whether presidential oversight is always an effective safeguard against agency overreaching. Two distinct and um, uh, overlapping but distinct concerns about executive power emerge from this rhetoric. One is that the power is unaccountable because bureaucrats are not elected or subject to meaningful political oversight. The other is that executive power is aggrandized and ever expanding. These concerns, although overlapping, suggest different remedies. Ensuring accountability might call for greater presidential oversight, but expanding presidential control over administration might worsen concerns about aggrandized power. As a result, the anti-administrativism coming from conservative quarters today is different from the unitary executive theory that conservatives traditionally espouse. Instead of turning to the president, the common response to these fears of unaccountable and aggrandized power is an assertion of a greater role for Article III courts. This judicial turn is the second trait that I see in contemporary anti-administrativism. It is most centrally manifested in efforts to replace deference with judicial independent judgment. And you see frequently that the attacks on judgment, on deference, come accompanied with an invocation of Marbury and the statement that is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Now, protecting a role for the Article III courts um, has always factored into deference doctrines. Um, that is why deference only applies once a court has found a statute to be ambiguous, right? Um, but we are now seeing an extreme argument to the effect that any deference at all violates the court's constitutional role. A third trait and theme that you see in contemporary anti-administrativism is the heavy constitutional flavor of the attacks on the administrative state. Sometimes statutes are invoked. Sometimes you get the argument that deference is at odds with the Administrative Procedure Act, for example. But overwhelmingly, the thrust of these attacks sound in a constitutional register. And while separation of powers concerns have long animated administrative law, usually they have lied in the, lain, lain in the background. Um, and now these constitutional concerns are really front and center. Moreover, these constitutional complaints are often presented in originalist terms. The problem with the administrative state is that it makes it easy for the government to bind individuals, whereas the framers intended that to be hard. Alternatively, the administrative state is seen as combining different forms of power into single agency hands, whereas the framers sought to separate out different forms of power into the separate branches. Now, in my view, these constitutional attacks are not successful. Even if you accept the originalist focus, many features of the administrative state that are deemed unconstitutional, such as deference, in fact, go back to the founding. Equally important, critics uh, portray separation of powers as simply aimed at limiting government. But in fact, the, the framers had multiple goals in setting up the structure of the federal government. Um, and they also sought to build up the national government and make it more effective. Uh, in addition, concerns about too much accumulated power uh, can be achieved through me mechanisms that, that operate at a subconstitutional level, for example, separation of functions requirements, bias protections, other mechanisms, um, as opposed to a pullback on the administrative state itself. Plainly, however, a number of justices on the Supreme, on the Supreme Court feel differently than I do, um, and they increasingly portray the national administrative state as fundamentally unconstitutional. So that is a description of contemporary judicial anti-administrativism. How important a phenomenon it is remains, I think, an open question. Um, as I, I hope my description conveyed, we're seeing um, in some of the claims that judicial anti-administrativists are advancing, they come in more radical and also more moderate forms. Um, uh, many of the more radical versions of these attacks come in concurrences or dissent and have not yet achieved a majority of the court. Um, we are still waiting to see if a majority will sign on. I think that this term will be a good sign of how far this is going to go. Even, however, if this anti-administrativism um, yields limited invalidations um, or remains mainly uh, in concurrences and dissent, I think it is a significant phenomenon. I think, uh, to begin with, some, that, some invalidations that seem limited, like you have to appoint ALJs differently in Lucia, 
um, can have some significant disruptive consequences for how the administrative state operates. Um, similarly, the presence of deference doctrines, um, people say it doesn't really matter if you get rid of Chevron. Maybe, but having Chevron there actually affects the kinds of cases that are presented. Um, and so even if it, there aren't that many cases that would change in terms of the cases we see now being brought with Chevron in the background, once Chevron is gone, we might actually see significantly more. More importantly, um, I think that this judicial anti-administrativism, particularly combined with the kind of attacks on administration and administrative government we're seeing from the White House and from parts of Congress, actually serve to undercut the legitimacy of the national administrative state. The frequent suggestion that that national administrative state is unconstitutional, along with the kind of rhetorical invocations against abuses of power-hungry bureaucrats, serves to call this, the state's legal, moral, and political legitimacy into question. Now, a contributing factor here is the extent to which discussions about government and administrative power have permeated popular debates, in part a reflection of the deep political polarization of our times. In the past, I think a discussion of the proper constitutional meets and bounds of administrative government might have been more re reserved for a more elite or legal discourse. Today, however, I think the popular engagement with these matters is far broader. Popular debates about the existence and dangerousness of the deep state, for example, um, showcase this. And I think that this identifies how the kind of anti-administrative rhetoric that we're seeing can take on a life of its own. There are two further effects of judicial anti-administrativism that I want to flag. One is the effect that it has on public views of the court, and the other is the impact it has on constitutional law. I think that the anti-administrativism's deeply rooted con conservative character means that constitutional attacks on the administrative state risk injecting the court even further into national politics, uh, and by uh, uh, insistently framing the debate as centering on the administrative state's unconstitutionality, anti-administrativism ignores the constitutional benefits that the administrative state can bring. To explore these two points, um, I'm now going to uh, talk about how the current attack on administrative government connects up to the attack we saw in the 1930s, um, and then at the end I'll talk about some ways uh, that we could see the administrative state as being constitutionally beneficial. So anti-administrativists um, often identify the progressive era from the late 19th century through to the early decades of the 20th as the time at which the national government went off the constitutional rails and over to the dark side of administrative government. Given those earlier progressive era measures, FDR's election in 1932 and the enactment of the broad regulatory statutes of the New Deal were not a sudden, sudden birth of national administrative government, but they did represent uh, a significant intensification. The forebears of contemporary anti-administrativists are the business conservative forces who took on the New Deal and the expanding administrative state in the 1930s. Many businesses were actually quite supportive of FDR and of national economic intervention to address the depression at first. Um, the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, in particular, they supported with the suspension of antitrust laws and its reliance on business-developed fair codes. This support began to sour, however, pretty quickly as protections for labor also emerged as part of the New Deal. There were two organizations that were central to business efforts to challenge the New Deal. One was the American Liberty League, and the other was the ABA Special Committee on Administrative Law. The Liberty League was the brainchild of several major industrialists, in particular the DuPont brothers, who ran the giant chemical and plastics company of the same name. The League claimed to be nonpartisan and had well-known Republicans and Democrats as members, but what did unite them all was their deep conservatism and antipathy for the New Deal and FDR. FDR then ran against the League in 1936, and uh, won a landslide victory, at which point the League essentially folded and went out, of, went out of business. But while it was active, the League published many pa pamphlets that attacked the New Deal on constitutional grounds, criticizing broad delegations, criticizing executive orders, warning of unlawful administrative assertions of power, and of expanding bureaucracy. And the League regularly turned to lawyers to make these constitutional arguments. It created a national uh, legal committee, the NLC, which was composed of many of the leading business lawyers of the, of the age, which wrote reports condemning major legislation like the National Labor Relations Act as unconstitutional. And then these reports were popularly condemned as serving the interests of the NLC members' business clients. Um, several of the League's lawyers and the NLC lawyers also argued constitutional challenges in the Supreme Court. So they filed brief in cases such as United States versus Butler, 
which challenged and overturned the Agricultural Adjustment Act, Carter versus Carter Coal, which challenged the Bituminous Coal Conservation Act, NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin, which challenged the NLRA and was the turning point um, when the court upheld it. Um, this constitutional assault on the New Deal actually had found a certain amount of favor up until 1937, but then hits a wall. The tides quickly turn, and within a few years, constitutional limits to economic regulation and national administration had largely disappeared. The ABA Special Committee, um, on the other hand, it was distinct from the League, but there was significant overlap between the members of the NLC and the members uh, who were leaguer, leaders of the ABA at the time. The ABA Special Committee also proclaimed neutrality um, uh, on New Deal policies, but it was repeatedly expressing concern about the spreading expanse of national administration. Interestingly, unlike the League, the Special Committee uh, really focused its attention on advocating for reforms to administrative process and to increased judicial review. Uh, the, the, the Special Committee was actually, in the end, um, much more effective than the League. Uh, the Special Committee was behind a bill, the Walter Logan Act, which passed Congress but was vetoed by FDR in 1939. Um, but its commi its, the committee's influence continued to be felt, um, and ultimately it was the legislation that the head of the Special Committee helped author that was enacted into law as the Administrative Procedure Act in 1946. Again, as I mentioned, that act continues to govern the federal administrative state to this day. Eight decades on, the national administrative state has expanded substantially from these New Deal and progressive roots. The 1960s and 1970s marked the addition of great society programs like Medicare and Medicaid, as well as new social regulations in terms of the environment, consumer protection, um, worker health. Um, and there have been other uh, recent additions, financial regulation, right? Um, health insurance are, are two. Uh, despite these changes, I think that the Special Committee and the Liberty League offer instructive parallels for understanding and assessing contemporary anti-administrativism. The 1930s represents the first and the last time that national administrative government was subject to the type of sustained constitutional challenge that we are seeing today. Strikingly, many of the current constitutional attacks are made in terms identical to those raised by the League. In addition, many of the legislative initiatives that we're seeing, like the Regulatory Accountability Act, are very similar to the kind of legislative moves that the Special Committee adopted. Recognizing contemporary anti-administrativism's connection to the failed challenges of the 1930s thus rec uh, recognizes its radical potential. If accepted, contemporary anti-administrativism's claims would require a reformation of the constitutional order that has governed for the last 80 years. The League and the Special Committee are equally important in highlighting the role that business leaders and conservative forces have played and continue to play in fostering resistance to national administration. To be sure, we often find today business leaders um, are at the forefront of pushing some regulatory initiatives, such as protecting civil rights. Um, and anti-administrativism, when you look at it and you look at the conservative underpinnings, reflects many different forms of conservatism, not just business conservatism. Yet it remains true that the business and economic conservatives who are critical in developing the New Deal attack um, on the newly emergent administrative state and they were joined by the elite lawyers of the day. It was also business and economic conservatives who continued to resist the national administrative state after World War II. In 1971, soon to be Justice Lewis Powell penned a famous memo to the Chamber of Commerce calling for a litigation strategy to defend business interests, spawning a birth of conservative legal organizations that are described as fulfilling the vision of the Liberty League. Today, business interests are closely tied to contemporary anti-administrativism. They are behind the regulatory rollbacks in the Trump administration and in Congress. Groups like the Chamber of Commerce and the National Federation of Independent Business frequently participate in litigation challenging administrative action, and a network of business lawyers often appears in the current attacks as occurred in the New Deal. The parallels um, to the 1930s are perhaps nowhere stronger than with respect to Charles and David Koch, the modern day equivalents of the DuPont brothers. The Koch brothers funding extends to a wide range of organizations associated with contemporary anti-administrativism, from conservative political organizations like the Tea Party, to conservative think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, to conservative academic centers studying the administrative state. In short, as was true in the 1930s, business conservative support has been critical to the growing prominence of contemporary anti-administrativism. The League and the Special Committee are significant also in discriminating, in demonstrating the inescapable political aspect of the current attack. 
on administrative government. Despite the fact that the League wrapped itself in the Constitution, no one doubted the political and economic interests that motivated its members. And as against that 1930s background, the current attempt appears as simply the latest in a series of conservative attempts to rein in national administrative government. To acknowledge this political character is not to deny conservative and administrativism's genuine constitutional concerns. It is instead to deny the separability of politics from efforts to mold the constitutional contours of the American state. But this inherent political overlay poses a particular challenge for contemporary anti-administrativism in the Supreme Court. Even if clothed in constitutional garb, judicial efforts to cut back on administrative governance will inevitably be seen in political terms. That is a particular concern when the Roberts Court is already perceived as heavily politicized and conservative due to recent appointments and fraught confirmation battles. There is thus a danger that if the court were to follow through on its administra anti-administrative rhetoric and significantly cut back on the administrative state, they will do long-lasting harm to the court's institutional legitimacy. Here, the 1930s are even uh, doubly instructive, just as we are now seeing calls for court packing in response to the recent confirmation battles. Of course, the major instance of threatened court packing was in the 1930s by FDR in response to the court's resistance to the initial measures of the New Deal. So this leaves my third and final topic, the effect of anti-administrativism on constitutional law. And I'll be briefer. Um, uh, as I described, you see at the core of this uh, contemporary anti-administrativism is an attack on constitutionality of administrative arrangements, right? It is portrayed, as I mentioned, as unaccountable and aggrandized executive power. I think anxieties about executive power are perfectly understandable today um, in our era of growing presidential unilateralism. Presidents are the focus of national political life and expectation, giving them expect incentives to expand their power in whatever ways they can. And one of the main levers that presidents have to exploit is their control over administrative government. As a result, presidential control over administration has become the dominant characteristic of national government. And they increasingly use that power not just to um, advance their policy priorities, but to advance those priorities in the face of a dysfunctional Congress. So I think concerns about expanding executive power have a real basis. But I also think that the attack on the administrative state gets the constitutional logic here exactly backwards. And that's because the administrative state performs critical constitutional functions. It is the administrative state with its bureaucracy, expert and professional personnel, its internal institutional complexity that holds the key to securing accountable, constrained, and effective exercise of executive power. Consider first the managerial oversight and supervision that runs throughout the administrative state and is sort of the classic characteristic of bureaucracy. This supervision is essential to ensure that low-level personnel are following politically determined policy and that important information about administrative activities reaches the highest level of political officials. To put it differently, it is bureaucracy and supervision that allow the president to take care that the laws are faithfully executed and that allow Congress to perform its constitutional role in setting national policy. Such internal mechanisms of control are also critical for achieving legal accountability. They reach a far broader array, array of agency action than judicial review ever can. Moreover, these mechanisms work proactively, helping to prevent unlawful actions from occurring in the first place and ensuring that governmental power is exercised within legal limits. Equally important are the variety of forces and interests within the administrative state that often operate as a check on one another and that preserve the rule of law. Career officials, such as executive branch lawyers, are a particularly important force. Their civil service protected status provides some independence, and they often feel bound by legal and professional norms that guard against abuse of authority. Agency structures reveal further internal divisions and checks on administrative decision making. Examples include separation of functions requirements that help guard against bias, internal watchdogs like inspector generals, or the fact that you often have multiple agencies bringing competitive perspectives to play in different statutory schemes. These internal administrative constraints embed separation of powers values into the very fabric of administrative government. They guard against excessive presidential aggrandizement by diffusing power throughout the executive branch, and they foster deliberation by bringing a range of perspectives to bear in setting executive policy. 
These internal forces also help empower external checks on the executive branch through the expertise and information that they provide to Congress and the network of relationships they have with Congress states and non-governmental indices. By thus supervising, checking, and improving executive branch decision making, the administrative state performs important constitutional functions. But probably its most important constitutional function is that it empowers and provides the means for effective governance. It brings that expertise, specialization, information, and institutional capacity to bear on complicated policy questions. Although anti-administrativists focus on the danger of too active government, an executive branch that fails to effectively perform the responsibilities that Congress has assigned to it should be equally troubling. Achieving energetic and effective governance was an express and central concern of the framers in designing national government. It is also essential if we are going to achieve responsive and democratically accountable government today. Interestingly, defenders of the administrative state in the 1930s, just to go back to the 1930s for a moment, justified it expanding administrative government on grounds very similar to the ones I'm articulating here. The uh, uh, Brownlow Committee, a committee on administration and management that FDR established, emphasized the importance of hierarchical supervision. James Landis's um, famous The Administrative Process defended the administrative state in terms of expertise and combined powers. Both urged uh, the need to expand the civil service, um, and both argued that energetic government is critical. Right? So again, if you look back to the 1930s, we can, we can get some important insights. Um, not only does the administrative state play a critical role in cabining and effectuating executive power, I want to close with the thought that the national administrative state is today con constitutionally obligatory. And the reason it is is because of delegation. Constitutional delegations of authority to the executive branch date back to the founding. And as I mentioned, they are the backbone of administrative government. Despite the Gundy case that's currently before the court, I do not think that the court is going to do away with delegation. But I think delegation comes with significant constitutional strings attached. One consequence of delegation is a constitutional need for adequate administrative uh, and oversight capacity to allow the laws to be faithfully executed. That means sufficient expert personnel to de implement delegated statutory responsibility. It means sufficient administrative resources to implement statutorily delegated responsibility. And delegations may also entail the kinds of internal structural checks and constraints that I have described to guard against the risks of executive branch aggrandizement that those very delegations create. In addition, delegations may entail deference in order to do justice to Congress's choice to give certain decisions to administrative agency. One of the unfortunate effects of contemporary anti-administrativism is not just that it obscures the administrative state's constitutional benefits, but that it makes this suggestion that the administrative state is constitutionally required seem quite outlandish. By insisting on reviving the constitutional challenges of the 1930s, anti-administrativists are forestalling the development of a separation of powers analysis that is better tailored to the reality of our current government. Such a 21st century account of administrative government is possible, however, if we put the blinders of contemporary anti-administrativism aside. Rather than laying siege to the administrative state, such an analysis would seek to maximize the constitutional benefits that it has to offer. And it would reorient separation of powers analysis to considering not just constitutional constraints on government, but also constitutional obligations to govern. Hopefully, that is a task that administrative and constitutional law scholars will embrace going forward. Thank you. That would be, uh, that you're right to identify that as sort of an, an, a possibility out there. Um, in the Free Enterprise uh, Fund case that I mentioned, one of the interesting things is that the court says, well, the question of Humphrey's executor wasn't raised, so we're not reaching it. Um, in the end, the court basically says, because a regime only has one level of four cause, it's okay. 
that kind of is endorsing Humphrey's executor. So in 2010, I think it's fair to say the Supreme Court was not willing to challenge Humphrey's executor. Um, Kavanaugh has been more willing to, although interestingly his decision um, in the CFPB uh, before on the DC Circuit was actually you know, remarkably functionalist. It was basically, we need to have an independent commission at the top so that they can all check each other. There's, there's nothing in the originalist attack or unitary executive attack about forces checking each other. Um, so he may have somewhat more variety in his views. But he certainly has been much more on the unitary executive track. Um, uh, and in his coming to the court, and, and Gorsuch may have some sympathy for that too, um, we might see Humphrey's executor uh, under attack. And that would just prove the point about where, how far we've moved. I just wondered if you could comment um, on President Trump has um, uh, announced that he's issuing a presidential permit on the Keystone XL oil pipeline. And that is, I guess it raises questions not just of expanded executive power, uh, but how the executive treats the administrative agencies that have been delegated uh, the the fact-finding process for it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, uh, I can give you some general ones. I don't know the specific statutory regime um, and whether or not uh, there is a basis for presidential review under the regime under which the permit is um, issued. So that's a rather major qualification because I can't say whether this is a dramatically different from the statutory scheme move. Um, uh, but I can say a few things. I mean, one thing that we have seen, and, and this is not a Trump administration development alone. Um, it was absolutely true under the Obama administration. It was true under the Bush administration of dramatically increased presidential direction of regulatory outcomes, right? I mean, think of the President uh, Obama's direction to the EPA to develop a rule governing coal plants, right? Um, uh, and so that's a phenomenon that's been happening more widely. Um, I do think we see under the Trump administration that it has expanded even more and you get presidential direction of certain kinds of results um, that uh, you know, go beyond maybe the, the processes that are even in the statutes. Um, I, when that happens, one of the things that happens is that lower courts tend to invalidate, not necessarily the presidential, but if the internal processes that um, a statutory scheme sets up aren't followed. Um, that's partially why we've seen a lot of invalidation in the lower courts of many um, Trump administrative initiatives. So they've tried to um, uh, repeal rules without going through notice and comment rulemaking, and lower courts have just struck that down. Um, they've tried to repeal rules without providing an adequate explanation of why they're changing course, and lower courts have just struck that down, um, without getting into questions of presidential involvement um, right in the, in, in the background. Um, and so uh, it's if you have a deviation from the standard process that is supposed to be uh, followed in issuing a permit, right? Um, uh, that's kind of opening yourself up to a little bit more of a, of a challenge uh, in the lower courts, if nothing else, because the, the real basis of the decision wasn't the one that was in the, uh, in the administrative record, right? Um, uh, but on the other hand, one of the things we're seeing is that the administration is trying to bypass the lower courts and go up to the Supreme Court. They've figured out that the Supreme Court is much more sympathetic on these issues, um, and they have been filing for cert before judgment. Um, in a number of cases. Um, the census case is the, is the prime example of this that's before the court this term, where um, the district court in New York um, held that um, initially authorized uh, a deposition of Wilbur Ross and also of uh, an official from the um, uh, DOJ civil rights, uh, finding that the reasons that were given on the administrative record were not the reason for adding the citizenship question to the census. Um, and uh, the government uh, filed for certiorari immediately um, and, a, and, and for a stay, um, actually first, and the Supreme Court granted a partial stay, not a full stay. Um, then the district court went back and uh, uh, reached the decision finding that the decision to add the citizenship question was arbitrary and capricious um, and not supported by the evidence in the record. Um, that case, the, the government got it before the court on cert. It's going to be heard in April. Um, uh, and part of the reason to get it up so quickly was, the, in part, the census has a time-limited framework, but it's also a sense that the Supreme Court is much more likely to be sympathetic to the government's arguments than the Second Circuit um, was going to be in that case. 
So we're, we're, we'll see from that case and from some of the others that are currently pending exactly how far the Supreme Court is going to go and whether it's going to try at all to rein in lower courts that it may disagree with or whether it's actually going to continue to allow some of these administrative challenges to administrative policies in the lower courts to continue. Maybe one more question. take the liberty of asking the last question in just a second, but also I wanted to let <coughs> you all know that you are invited to a um, reception immediately following the lecture in the gallery, which if you sort of head out of this room and keep going left, eventually you'll get to um, the gallery. So I guess the question that I'll end on is what can we do as lawyers, law students, law professors to sort of check anti in the, you know, sort of our daily lives and the people who we um, who maybe aren't as clued in as to what is going on and also in our professional capacity as well. Um, well, I actually think it, it, it is things, um, for lawyers, it's things like a Law and Government Institute and other places that um, uh, both convey the importance of what goes on in government, but also brings good people to seeing working in government as a career that will be rewarding and important. Um, uh, I do think that the check on a lot of administrative abuse is having really good people working in government. Um, I, and so um, you know, curbing anti-administrativism from the inside in that sense. Um, uh, I do find it interesting the degree to which I, th I think these battles are reaching the, the public's attention now. Um, the things like the census case, for example, I think that's gotten a lot of attention and people are seeing the stakes because the impact is so clear. Um, so being involved in issues like that that you may care about is another important one.